So I'm here today and I want to talk about a few financial concepts that some very few people in the business know about and even fewer of them actually talk about. And then I want to get on to talk about a project that I've been working on that will hopefully rectify some of these problems. Um, but first of all, I want to talk about a friend of mine. His name is Ben Bitdiddle, and I want to tell you a little story about him. Okay, so once upon a time, there was this very smart engineering student named Ben Bitdiddle. He got his first job, and he talked to his friends and said, well, what am I going to do with my 401k? So like everyone else, they said, well, stocks are the best investment, 7% a year for, you know, over the past 100 years. So he follows their advice. He loses about half his money in the 2008 crash, and he decides there's got to be a better way. So he sets up a home office for himself. And he starts looking at trading strategies. But for any of you who have ever actually tried trading, he ended up in an even worse place than when he started. His palms would get sweaty. He would try to go counter trend against the market. In fact, at one point, he even got to this point where he couldn't think at all, and his hands would completely lose all the blood in them. It was a very strange sensation. So he decided to throw out the efficient market hypothesis, which said, Making money trading is impossible, despite his own experience, and embrace algorithmic trading. Maybe if he can't trade, maybe he can get a computer to do it for him. After all, computers don't get sick. They don't need a retirement plan. They don't get nervous. They can do all the kinds of things with absolute perfection that Ben Bitdiddle himself can't do. So before he knows it, he's reading books on technical analysis. He starts looking at all kinds of indicators, you know, the usual stuff that you look at, moving averages, stochastics, RSI. He puts things together, and he tests a few different things until finally one day he comes up with something pretty decent. But he's very naive. He's never done this before. So he tweaks and he tweaks, and he tries hundreds of thousands of millions of combinations of different indicators until one day he comes up with something that looks like this on his paper trading backtest. For those of you who know anything about backtesting, you know there's a lot of problems when you do this, especially when you're trying hundreds of thousands of combinations of things. But Ben Dittel was very naive, plus he's a human being, and all humans have this psychology where they see something that's too good to be true, they definitely want to believe it. So it went straight to his head, he thinks, I have the perfect strategy, he's going to go out, he's going to start a hedge fund, man, he's going to make a billion dollars, he, he's got it made now. So he quits his job, he moves to New York City, so he starts marketing his idea to everybody, to financiers and other people in the business, getting them interested in it, and um, he sells it as a black box system. So they have no idea how it works. He's like a magician. He's saying, I'm not going to tell you what's in the box, but behind the scenes, he doesn't even know how it works, to be honest. He has no theory behind what he's doing. He just threw a bunch of stuff that he kind of cobbled together, but he's not going to tell them that because, again, he wants to believe it. They want to believe it. Just like a Ponzi scheme, um, people believe what they want to believe. So before he even knows it, he sets up a business. He gets a billion dollars thrown at him to invest. This is before a single penny has actually traded in real markets. This is all based on paper promises. He hires armies of PhDs. He hires Nobel laureates. He gets reams of computers. They start tweaking his system, improving it, running it on real money. And sure enough, everything works out pretty well. The live performance of the system looks very similar to his testing. He's very happy. People are throwing even more money at him. Everything seems to be going well. And then what happened? <laughs> Fateful day came along, and he lost like 95% of the value in a very short period of time. You know, there were all these crises going on around the world, and he mostly blames them. And if you've ever read Black Swan, then you'll understand that all kinds of... Um, Market events, extreme market events, are very, very common and much more common than people usually assume that they are. However, um, that said, I don't really want to focus on so-called black swan events because here at Elliott Wave and Qualitative Analytics, we don't really believe in black swan events. We believe that everything that happens in the market is endogenous, regulated with social mood. So even crises are forecastable and foreseeable. So, but actually, before I go and actually talk about these principles that he violated, let's go back for a second. You may actually recognize this curve. This is a, the real equity curve of long-term capital management. And a lot of the story that I just told you about Ben Bittedel, if you replace his name with John Merriweather, it's actually entirely accurate. In fact, they did give him a billion dollars to manage before he had ever actually had any kind of live track record going. Um, so, but... 
what I want to talk about now is I want to bump up kind of one level of abstraction and talk about general principles that Ben Bitdiddle violated in this case. So the first principle that he violated was lack of a theory, okay? So he just threw stuff together. He didn't really have a cohesive base built upon. There wasn't a lot of research. It's not like socionomics where we have many different papers we've published looking at it from many different angles and taking another step on top of a foundation. Instead, he kind of just cobbled things together. So to give you an idea, an analogy of why a theory is so incredibly important is imagine you took your car, okay, down to a mechanic and he, you had it there for a couple days um, and then he, he comes to you after the end of the couple of days and he says, okay, well, you know, we just tried a bunch of random stuff with your car, you know, we moved some few gears here and moved some hoses over here and finally it quit making that weird noise. But we don't really know why, but it seems to be working now. So would you trust this car mechanic? Okay, you, you shouldn't because although the car may seem to work for a little while and it may, you know, go down the road just fine, you may discover later that, you know, the gas is going through the cigarette lighter, and if you're a smoker, you're gonna have a really bad time. It sounds extreme and crazy, but this is actually not that different from what many money managers out there do when they don't have any kind of theory to base what they're doing on. Another major thing that people run into is in-sample curve fitting. Um, this is almost impossible for people not to do for lots of different reasons. Just to give you a simplistic example, these are four prices from Apple Computer back in 2014. So what I did was um, just took some simple equations that you learned from grade school, like a line and a polynomial, and you can change the constants around and make them fit this data absolutely perfectly. But the problem with this, of course, if you take these equations and you extrapolate them and you look at more data, you see they completely fail and they have no predictive value at all. So they're worthless. Um, this may seem kind of silly in a way because these are extremely simple models. Nobody out there really uses lines or polynomials, obviously. But the same concept of in-sample, out-of-sample applies no matter how complex your model is. And there are people out there with incredibly complex models. Um, some of the most complex are called Turing-complete, and these are models that can do anything, compute anything under the sun, but they still have this exact same problem. Um, in fact, I was at uh, Georgia Tech um, about a month ago, and there was a professor there, very smart guy, who's showing off some of the systems he's developed. And he didn't do any out-of-sample testing at all. The whole thing was completely in sample, and I talked to him about it, and he had a, a list of different reasons why it really wasn't necessary to do that, why he felt you know, in sample only was just fine. But um, I think the thing is, it doesn't matter how smart somebody is, it's, it's just this natural psychological compulsion that you want things to look as good as possible on paper, and so they fall into this trap. Um, okay, here's a meme that I really like. Um, this applies more to software, though, which is basically, you should really test things before you release them and let other people use them. But this meme is actually accurate when it comes to trading strategies. That's the irony, because it, I don't trust anybody who shows me something on paper, really. And um, Paul Tudor Jones, just giving an example, has said that he won't he won't use anybody's trading strategy or system unless he's seen it run on real money for several years and seen uh, good results. So when it comes to trading strategies, you have to test it in production, unfortunately. There's really only so much you can do um, when you're just testing it um, before you're running it on real money. Although there are some techniques you can do, and I'll mention some of those later. So another big problem people run into is too many trials problem. So if we go back to our friend Ben Bitdiddle from before, Let's pretend that one day he wants to be just as good as Marksman as Robin Hood, okay? So let's say every single day he goes out, he takes a bow and arrow, and he tries to shoot a bullseye, and he does this a thousand times a day for 10 years, okay? And then finally he gets a bullseye, and then on the second shot, he splits the arrow in half, and he says, well, I'm just as good as Robin Hood now. Now you see the problem with this, obviously, is that Robin Hood said what he was gonna do in the fable and did it immediately on one, one try, okay? And if Ben Bitdiddle does this millions and millions of times and gets it right only once, the odds that it were due to luck are essentially infinite. So he's just, just got lucky, basically. And another analogy I really like, they had this featured in The Simpsons too, is that let's say you have millions of monkeys typing at millions of typewriters. And you know, one monkey finally writes a winner's tale. So you immediately grab that monkey and you say, oh gosh, I'm gonna go parade him all around you know, this, the uh, United States and he's gonna write all kinds of other great novels and works. 
but that's probably a bad idea, because if you had that many monkeys working at that many typewriters, the one monkey that was right probably isn't that bright. It was just due to luck. So if you do too many trials, you test too many things, you're going to have a bad time. Too many degrees of freedom. This is another big one, and, and all these are kind of very much related in my mind. This really makes it easier to curve fit. So I want to tell you a little story about Kim Peek here, and some of you may recognize him. He's an autistic savant. His amazing ability to memorize, he can memorize zip codes, phone numbers, historical facts. He's basically, he's like a living, walking Google, okay? Um, he was played by Dustin Hoffman in the movie Rain Man, if you've ever seen that, which is a great movie. I really recommend it. But I saw this documentary, and they were talking to Kim Peek, and they had this list of, of different items on it, and it was like caramel, candied apple, you know, sugar cane, all these different things, and um, the general theme of all of, all of these was sweet, okay? But Kim Peek, he could memorize visually the entire list of items, but he couldn't come up with a general theme. They said, what do these have in common? And he just was completely stumped, okay? So what Kim Peek could not do was perform induction. And what induction is, is you take all these random disparate facts, you put them together, and you come up with general rules from those disparate facts, and you can use these general rules to predict the future. And most people do this all day, every day. In fact, this is why we're not very good at rote memorization, because our brains are not necessarily always trying to memorize every detail. We're constantly trying to aggregate these details into um, general rules that we can use to predict the future with. So what degrees of freedom means is if you're building a strategy and you've got too many little levers on it, too many buttons, and you're flipping the levers, tweaking things around, it's a large amount of surface area you have to modify, and you end up memorizing the data as opposed to inducing general rules with predictive value about the future. In other words, you're building a Kim Peak by accident without ever meaning to build a Kim Peak. And part of the reason why it's so hard not to do this is because, again, the more you memorize, the better everything looks on paper. So it's kind of ironic because in some cases, something that looks much worse on paper is actually far superior in terms of its future predictive value. Because trust me, when you put your money with, with a money manager, that's all you care about. You don't care about you know, the promises on paper. You care about what's going to actually happen in the future. Stuck in a local maximum. So this also relates to the idea of a theory that we talked about earlier. So I want to give you another analogy here. So let's pretend that I'm really good at baseball. I have an amazing fastball, and I'm on my A game when I throw my fastball. But you know, let's say that I could be even better if I could throw a curveball. But in order to throw a curveball, I'm going to have to take some time, and I have to learn how to do it. And I may actually get a little bit worse at throwing a curveball before I get better overall at baseball. So if I'm throwing my A-game fastball, maybe I'm at this little peak here in terms of my ability at baseball. And I really want to get to this other peak there by throwing my fastball, OK? But again, I have to get worse before I get better. I have to go downhill before I can get to the top of a new and better place. So how does this relate when you're, when you're dealing with trading strategies? Well, if you have a theory, then you might have the ability to discover something really radical and new and different to try to get to that higher peak. But if you're dealing with a black box system, kind of like what our friend Benton Bitdiddle was dealing with, there's no way to leap to that level. You, every time you change something, you're starting to go downhill, and the feedback you're getting from your testing is saying, oh, it's getting worse, it's getting worse, it's getting worse. So you'll never actually get to that higher place. And without a theory, you don't know what radical changes to try in order to get to that uh, superior strategy. Um, tail risk, I'll just mention this very briefly because I think people know more about this now than they used to. But basically, um, a lot of recent work is showing that extremely dramatic market events, such as the 1987 crash I have here, are both more common and more devastating than people think that they are. So if you're relying on a normal distribution too heavily when you're designing strategies, you're going to have a bad time. Finally, um, some of my favorite ones, which is non-stationarity. David Aronson writes a book um, called Evidence-Based Technical Analysis. He has this analogy in it, which I really like. So I want to describe, before we talk about non-stationarity, let's talk about stationarity, which is simpler to understand. So imagine I have a box, OK? And the box is filled with beads, and there are different colors. And there's a certain number of beads of every single color in this box. 
Now, if I go in and I add up the beads of every color, then I'll feel really smart because if somebody reaches in and pulls out beads randomly, then I can tell you with a pretty good you know, probability about how many beads you're gonna get of each color, okay? And I measure the box once, and that holds constant throughout time. That's a stationary box. You measure its statistical properties and those hold constant throughout time. A lot of people have the illusion that the markets operate this way. Um, and a great example of this was in the late 60s. There was a group of growth stocks called the Nifty 50. And people thought, oh, I just buy the Nifty 50, they're outperforming the index, I can short the index and I can make free money, okay? It sounds like a great deal, and I'm sure many people probably way over leveraged when they were doing this strategy and getting really excited about it. But then in the 1970s, of course, this property of the market completely reversed. They dramatically underperformed, and a lot of people went bust that were doing that. So if you assume markets are stationary, again, you're gonna have a bad time. So non-stationary is basically, you have the box, you've counted all the beads in it of different colors, you think you know what's going on, but then a little kid comes up to you, and he pokes a hole in the box, the beads start falling out the bottom. Another kid's coming, he's shoveling more beads in the top, and every single day the distribution of beads is changing. And now suddenly you don't know what's going on anymore, but that's the reality of the way the markets work. And it often ends like this. So there's got to be a better way. And there is a better way. So the one I want to propose here is the Elliott Wave Principle. It was developed by Ralph Nelson Elliott back in the 1930s. He basically was a very smart corporate accountant, and he was stricken ill um, for many years. And he basically sat um, in his hospital bed, and he was looking at market prices. And he discovered this pattern, this Elliott Wave uh, structure to the market. And this structure forms a hierarchical nested pattern, which is a fractal. And what's interesting is he didn't even use the term fractal, because nobody knew what, what fractal was back then, really. Um, it wasn't until many years later that Mandelbrot came by and quantified it you know, what fractals really were, and power laws, and all of those associated things. So what I'm showing you here is a robust fractal, which is the way the Elliott Wave Principle manifests in real market data. That means it doesn't quite look like our idealized model here. There's a lot more variability, a lot more noise. You know, there's an emotional panic when the central bank did something. You know, things like all kinds of little extra detail thrown in there. But for the most part, um, if you look back and squint, you'll see this is a beautiful, beautiful Elliott wave pattern. And it's not altogether too often that the market gives you a pattern that's this clear. And I was very excited about this. This was counted in real time by uh, Steve Hochberg, Elliott Wave International. And I remember following this during the 2008 crash, and a lot of people I talked to were in a complete panic over the crash. Um, and I kind of had the exact opposite experience as them. I was very confused with the markets beforehand, but as soon as it entered this crash phase, um, the wave counts became so clear, it was just obvious exactly what was going on every step of the way. So the cool thing about Elliott Waves is we can use them to trade the markets as a technical analysis method, but what's interesting about them and unique about them is that they appear at all degrees of scale, all the way back from millennium waves down to the short-term five-minute charts, and so far we've seen them in all financial data that we've looked at. So we talked about non-stationarity before, so far, Elliott waves um, have been consistent throughout time. So we decided we want to hang our hat on Elliott waves for all the reasons we just talked about, and also on computers because of the massive advantages they have when it comes to trading markets as opposed to humans. So based on these ideas, um, back in the 1980s, the idea for e-waves was proposed, which is the Elliott wave analysis and validation expert system. Um, this is the product me and uh, a few other people at Qualitative Analytics have been working on for the past couple years. So what is eWaves? It's software, it automates Elliott Wave analysis. We have a separate strategy module which takes the analysis that we produce, converts it into buys and sells on futures and equities markets. And before we even talk about it, and before you get too excited, I want to emphasize that this is beta software right now. Um, we have not had a release version yet. We have a newsletter out, we're talking a lot about it, and we're hoping within the next year um, we'll have a release version available. So I wanna take a little detour, talk about what is AI, just because it's, to me it's, it's a very cool subject, especially philosophically, to talk about. 
Because when we tell people E-Waves is AI software, they get all these crazy ideas that are very far removed from the reality of it. You know, they think about Androids like this, but the practical world of AI is, is really nothing like that. Although there are a few fringe people working on things that are like this, but E-Waves is certainly not one of those programs. Um, if you've ever seen the imitation game, they have uh, Alan Turing, and um, he has this, this famous Turing test that he proposes. He wants to see whether or not a computer can fool enough people into thinking that it's a human. And his idea was if it could fool enough people, then he would declare the computer to be artificially intelligent. Now, this test sounds great on paper, and it was proposed a long time ago, but it was in the 1950s that it was completely destroyed, really, with a, a program called ELIZA, which was a very, very simple program that this guy wrote. And it acted like a psychologist. So the human would come in, they'd be talking to the computer, and the computer would basically say, well, how does that make you feel? You know, questions like that. And people were like, oh, gosh, oh, this is definitely a human on the other end. So it was very easy to fool people. And with these simple chat bots, it became pretty clear the Turing test just doesn't really cut it and, and doesn't really mean anything. Um, one of my favorite philosophical discussions about AI, though, is the Chinese room. So what this is, is you have a guy in a room, okay, and he doesn't really know any Chinese at all. He only knows English. You have these people outside of the room that think the guy in the room is this genius who knows, you know, Chinese very, very well, because whatever they put in the room to translate, he translates and then puts it back out to them. But meanwhile, what they don't know is inside of the room, somebody else who is very smart designed a mechanical process for him to follow. You know, write this word here, look this word up here, take something from bucket three, put it in bucket one. He follows this rote mechanical process. And at the end of the day, he can produce the, um, the uh, conversion between the two languages. So this is more like how computers really work. You know, from externally, you might think it's doing something intelligent, but the people making the sausage know that there's a mechanical process behind the scenes. And for me, I don't really care, to be honest. As long as it works, that's what really matters. But the broadest definition of AI in my mind, because there's so many different fields of it, so many different disciplines, but if you step really far back and say, what's the difference between normal software versus software that exhibits intelligence? Um, this is how I would define it. If you had this problem um, in school and you already know how to solve it, as you say, what's, what's the length of x? Well, it's 4 squared plus 3 squared. You take the square root. Everybody's learned this. If you told a computer to do that, that would not be AI, because you're explicitly saying here's step one, step two, step three. But what is a uniquely human trait is the ability to figure out that equation in the first place, okay? And that's something that, to me, sounds more like intelligence. And that, that's the, really the broadest definition of AI, is if you can get a computer to come up with the equation on its own, that's a bit more interesting. Let's set the stage for the first version of E-Wave. So this was back in 1982 brand new firm named Elliott Wave International came out with this forecast using this esoteric, very little known method called the Elliott Wave Principle, saying that despite all the gloom and doom of the 1970s, the stagflation, the back-to-back -back recessions, the declare of, you know, people were declaring the end of the US dollar as the world's reserve currency, that instead of going into a deeper depression, we were gonna have the greatest bull market in all of history. And of course, this is exactly what happened. And it didn't take very long, maybe about four years into this, before a lot of people started noticing and catching on. And the 80s was, was, a, was a great era for getting the word out about Elliott Wave Theory. And when the Elliott Wave Principle started circulating more and more during this time as the bull market went on, it caught the attention of one engineer at uh, Lockheed Martin. This is a picture of the Saturn V rocket there, just to orient you. Um, he said, wow, this was a real eye-opener. All the skills in pattern recognition, statistics, and expert systems that I had acquired were suddenly connected and applicable to a real-world financial problem. After going through the Lockheed management for approval, I sent an unsolicited proposal to Robert Prechter of Elliott Wave International. And that was really the beginning of the E-Waves project, which again started in 1986. But there was a problem back in 1986. This is a picture of the Cray-2 supercomputer. This was the most powerful computer in the world in 1986, and today it would be less powerful than a second generation iPad. So E-Waves was, in many ways, the first version of it was way ahead of its time. Um, 
just to give you an idea, even today we run tests on it and they take like weeks and weeks to run with the original version. You can just imagine what happened in 1986. It almost wasn't even possible to run the program at that time. So E-Wave has been on the back burner for quite a while. Um, a few years ago, um, when I joined EWI, we sort of blew the dust off of E-Waves, um, started getting it to run again on modern machines. And this is the first version, E-Waves 1.0, that we revitalized with as few changes as we had to make to it from the original version developed at Lockheed. One of the things I wanted to point out here, first of all, if you know wave analysis, you'll see a nice impulse wave into the 2000 high in the Dow here. But the most important thing about this chart is really how I've blown up the right-hand side here. You can see just how much detail E-Waves needs to look at in order to produce a wave count. It's absolutely massive and a, and a major challenge for computers, at the, certainly in the past and, and even today. But there's some things that I'm very excited about, even with the original version 1.0 and some of the issues it has, because again, it's beta software. It, it, every now and then it's produced some really startling forecasts. Uh, this is one of my favorite counts that it's produced. So if you know your early wave theory, what we have here is a five of a five. So this is portraying a, a major reversal in the Nikkei back in 1989. And of course, everybody knows what's happened since then in Japan. They've been in and out of recessions and deflation and all kinds of hardships and the Nikkei's declined. So this is a very prescient forecast and this was made entirely by a computer. And so what's also interesting about this to me is that this forecast spans almost 50 years, okay? So E-waves counts Elliott waves, but it doesn't really care about the scale that the pattern occurs at. It, to E-waves, a five minute chart is no different from a chart that spans centuries. And the forecast is the same and the way you would trade it is identical. So what we did with 1.0, we, we took over a flash product, we were issuing signals with it, and we really weren't happy with the first version. So what we did is we decided to go talk to some people that develop trading strategies um, with Elliott Waves, or that trade on their own using Elliott Wave patterns. We talked to a few guys, and we came up with two ideas, basically, from them about how to trade using Elliott Waves. And what's interesting about this is if you go back to the too many trials thing I talked about earlier, here we had two trials, basically, just two different things we wanted to try. And we threw out about half the data because we said, you know, we, we, before we make, when we make a decision on this, we want to have the out-of-sample stuff come in later, you know, after we've already made up our minds on this. Um, and it was a major improvement over what we had with version 1.0 because it's one thing to have an analysis engine, but it's another thing to say, okay, the analysis may be right, the analysis may be wrong, you need to defend yourself against that and build a strategy around the analysis process itself. So that's the futures equity curve on not equal weighted. We did an ETF and stocks curve as well. Um, and I'll talk more about these in an upcoming newsletter if you wanna read about it. I'm writing one called Lies, Damn Lies, and Back Tests, and we'll talk about all the things that go into back testing and why you gotta be really careful about any kind of paper trading, even the stuff I'm showing you and the, the diligence we try to put into it to avoid a lot of those pitfalls. Um, one thing that we did notice is the more you diversify and the more different trades you take across different markets, generally the smoother things get, which makes a lot of sense if everything's statistically independent. But uh, this is in a stark contrast. I, I love showing this chart because if you talk to many traditional financial uh, advisors, they'll tell you put something in the S&P, put something into foreign stocks. You know, you put stuff into all these different markets, but they're all correlated. So you really, the diversification doesn't matter. What you really need is targeted diversification, which means things that truly are not related to each other. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about our motivation and why we care about E-Waves. So first of all, E-Waves is definite, and it's the first time anyone's really tried to make a definite version of the elite wave principle. Um, today, you could talk to two different wave analysts and you might get the completely opposite opinion for different reasons. Both may be very, very smart wave analysts. And I don't wanna say that's necessarily a problem because if you think about it, two people could be 100% uncorrelated. They could always disagree, both be good analysts, and actually both end up with a good track record. So it's not necessarily the end of the world that that's the case. But nevertheless, in terms of convincing the broader community of academics and economists that Elliott wave theory is real, is valid, has significance, we really need to convert it into a definite form. And that's what we're trying to do with E-waves. So this is, this is our most important goal right now with E-waves. 
It's also non-discretionary. This has lots of advantages to it for the same reason that algorithmic trading has advantages over doing it by hand. That is, you eliminate the subjectivity and eliminate the human factor out of the equation completely. You know, another advantage of this is that we could have basically as many markets as we want. Computers are cheap um, and have them do the analysis for us around the clock. So there's a lot of advantages to going with a non-discretionary approach. E-way to scale invariant, I talked about this earlier, but uh, basically if it sees a duck, it doesn't care if the duck is the size of your pinky or if it's the size of a building. It's all the same to E-waves, which I think um, is rare in terms of most types of analysis that I've seen, but it's very exciting. It gives it a large degree of homogeneity. Um, and another advantage to uh, scale invariance is that when we're doing our testing, we can test not just across the data in terms of time, but we can test at all different degrees of scale. So it actually kind of gives us another dimension, which is really, really cool. E-Waves is contextual. So what this means is that it incorporates a lot of different things that it looks at before it makes a decision. And just to give you a simple example of that, if you look at sentiment as an indicator, um, there's a lot of issues with it. If you look back in the early 1980s, we had major peaks in the stock market with relatively low sentiment. And then if you go to the roaring 90s, we had sentiment off the charts, but the market just kept going and going and going. So what we do is we want to take everything we look at and take it into the context of the wave counts before we make a decision. That is, you've got to look at the whole elephant, not just one part of the elephant. E-Waves is white box. So we're really the opposite of Ben Bit Diddle that I talked about earlier. We know every detail about how E-Waves works, what it's doing, and we built in a lot of facilities into E-Waves so that if it produces an analysis for us, our more, much more experienced Elliott Wave analysis analysts can come in and take a look at that output, and then we can actually go in and see exactly why E-Waves produced that analysis, and then we can figure out how to fix it. So this way we're working with the Elliott Wave principle and we're not just um, curve fitting a black box system. Now, here's something I wanted to note, which is the Wave principle itself is out of sample since 1938 because there really have been no modifications made to the theory at all since then. That said, we're still very careful with that because we don't think of E-waves as the Elliott Wave principle at all. We think of it as our implementation of the Elliott Wave principle, our best attempt to convert it into something that a computer can do. And so because of that, we're still very careful with doing out of sample techniques. But nevertheless, the fact that we have a theory to base it on, I think is a huge advantage in terms of avoiding those kinds of pitfalls that many other people do, because we're implementing a theory. And another way that I like to phrase this is we care just as much about how E-Waves produces its results as the results themselves, okay? How is almost more important than the results. Now, you don't want the results to be terrible, obviously. So they matter somewhat, but the main thing is that I'd rather see reality and, and see something that might work in the future rather than something that looks great on paper. And so by using the wave principle as our guard rail and building up from that, um, it really helps with that. So here's the main thing that I'm here to talk about, the main thing that I'm really excited about is version two of the software, because this is what's gonna allow us to exit beta um, and uh, bring a whole new slew of products to the table. So we took the, the 1980s project and we studied it. We determined there's a lot of areas we could improve upon, okay? So just in terms of applying the LEB principle itself, we think we could probably improve about 70% of the original program, had a lot of issues with it, with how it works. We think we can do better pattern recognition with it. Computers are very, very good at doing rote calculations, but they're very, very bad at looking at amorphous objects like a tree and telling you that that's a tree. But that's the kind of stuff we're trying to do with E-Waves is pattern recognition. Um, we're trying to improve the performance in terms of the speed that the program runs so that we can do faster research. And this is really critical because right now, all our tests, again, they take weeks and weeks to run with the old version. So, I mean, if we can make anything a little bit faster, then as we iteratively improve things using our, our guess and check method, is what we call it internally, um, we can get that feedback and see whether every change we're making, we're seeing improvements um, along the way. So sp speed is absolutely critical. And finally, we wanted to moderate, modernize the program because back in the 1980s, um, that was before there were even computer science degrees, so um, it's a bit of, there's a lot of spaghetti code in it, basically. 
So what we came up with was this layered architecture. You split the program up into lots of different pieces. Um, I got a friend of mine here, um, coworker, I should say, too. He's working on the graphical display. And the nice thing about splitting things up is that I don't really have to think about or understand how his part works. It's completely independent from everything else I'm working on. It's not going to affect the counting engine or the strategy module or any of the other parts of the program. So this made it a lot easier to split the work up among um, a team of people and make progress really, really fast. We're designing everything in a test-driven fashion. So we actually have one guy that does nothing but, well, he does a lot of stuff for us. But one of the things he does, which none of us want to do, is sit there um, day in and day out. He's done like thousands of charts of Elliott wave patterns that he sketched by hand. Okay, and then we pull these into the program and they get converted into tests for e-waves to make sure that it's analyzing the markets the way we want it to. Um, so those are, we call those the correctness tests, just making sure the program's doing what we think it's gonna, what we think it should do. And then we have another slew of tests which we haven't built yet called validation tests. And these kind of, these are a level of abstraction higher. These are meant just to say, you know, is the program viable? Um, and that'll involve more statistical studies. We've got some things in mind. Um, one of them is called real versus random, where we run the program on random data. We run it on real market data. And then basically we see, um, is it less able to see Elliott wave patterns in the random data and more able to see them in real data and can quantify the difference for us? Um, then that will be one way we're gonna validate the Elliott wave principle. E-Waves 2 is adaptive, again, with the speed improvements we've made to the program, we're gonna start getting feedback from the computer. So as we make changes to it, we'll be able to see what happens with those changes. We're gonna be able to look at the analysis and it becomes almost this real-time process. So here's one of the cool parts about how it works internally in terms of how we sped things up. So E-Waves 1 was written in the 1980s, okay? And back then, computers, or at least the, the kind you'd have on your desk, could really only do one thing at a time. So if we wanted to run an analysis on the S&P, on gold, on treasury bonds, on oil, okay, you know, we'd have to have a single computer for each of those. Now what we can do is computers have more cores on them. They can do more than one thing at a time. So now we can take the original program. We can run the S&P, gold, T-bonds, oil. We can run them on one computer each together, which, you know, helps a little bit. We don't have to buy as many computers. It's kind of nice. But you know, what would be much better than this is if you could run the analysis on the S&P just on one machine, maybe split the work up and have all the cores working on just the S&P. Then by buying more computers, because again, computers are cheap, we'd be able to do analysis much, much faster. So this is the design we came up with, E-Waves 2. We have a controller, which is our graphical interface, which we use to command an army of computers, and each machine is responsible for a single market. So this way we can see massive speed increases in terms of, of, of how fast things are going. And um, finally, the last thing I like to talk about is uh, it's not always about working harder and using more of the computer to speed things up. We work smarter in a lot of cases, so we've added a lot of cool stuff into E-Waves 2. And one of the things, you'll notice this, first of all, if you're familiar with Elliott Waves as uh, trend channels, and one thing that the program might do quite often is it'll take um, a line, let's say connecting waves one and wave three, and project it into the future. And you might want to know what that intersection point is with the line. So this is something that you, know, you can do with traditional financial software. And to a human eye, it's more or less instantaneous when the computer does it because they're so incredibly fast. Now, the way a human would solve this is you just put a ruler up on the chart. Okay, you draw the line with the ruler. Oh, that's where it intersected. But computers aren't that smart, so the way most, most software does it is they sit there and they test each and every little price point, one point at a time. Say, did this one intersect? Did this, this one intersect? This one intersect? This one? Okay, again, it's fast, because computers are fast, but a program as sophisticated as E-Waves might need to do this millions and millions of times in one analysis, and the time really adds up. In fact, with E-Waves 1, we have one step, which takes about five minutes doing some of this stuff. Um, and over the course of an entire analysis, it adds at least an hour to some of, our, some of our tests. Some of them have even more. So we said, okay, well, this is actually, we can come up with something better than this. So imagine how ridiculous this sounds if I tell you you couldn't find your toothbrush. And I said, what I want you to do is I want you to walk around the entire planet staring at the floor and study every inch of the planet one inch at a time until you find your toothbrush. Well, you think I was crazy, but that's what the computer's doing in this case. 
So humans don't think about space that way. They don't think about finding things in terms of looking at every little granular spot. They think hierarchically. They think, oh, a toothbrush is in a drawer, and the drawer is in a room, and the room's in a building, which is in a city. So if I say, you know, you think your toothbrush is in China, you think, oh, well, you're going to eliminate millions of miles of search space immediately, just like that. So basically we said, well, the computer should be able to do the same thing. So this intersection testing, I won't go into too much detail. You can ask me more about this later, but we use a technique where you hierarchically subdivide the space. It's used a lot in computer graphics, and we adapted it. Um, we're probably the first financial program to use this on financial data, but basically it allows us to do analysis ultra, ultra fast and figure out where intersections are. And this process, which took five minutes before, is down to last time I measured it, it was 0.18 of a second, I think. So it definitely has made a huge improvement uh, in e-waves, too. So here's sort of our timeline. So in May of 2013, um, EWI has a service called the Flash Services, and these used to be driven by a human. It's a subscription service where you get buy and sell signals on futures and equity markets. And we took that over with version one of e-waves back in 2013. Then in June, we started building out version two, just some basic ideas. At the time, we, we didn't even know it was gonna become version two. Um, we were just looking at a lot of the issues with V1 and how we could resolve them with a, much, with a superior approach. Then in October, uh, we launched the e Flash newsletter. We decided we wanted to get the word out, get people excited about this product. Um, in July is when we came up with a new and superior trading strategy to use on the original analysis. And just now in February, we finally got version two operational. Now, it doesn't mean it's ready to be used yet, but it means that the core of it's working, it's producing analyses, we can look at charts. And for the first time ever, we're, the team right now is so hyped up over just the past month, it's like now we finally have the analysts coming in. It's not just these you know, programmers working in a cave anymore, it's the analysts coming in, taking a look at the charts and saying, oh, that's not right. Or, oh, this is a good count, you know, things like that. And now we're getting that feedback loop started for the first time. So we're super excited that we're going to um, make a lot of progress over the next year. But at this point, basically, we're improving the analysis of the program. That's our main focus right now. And then eventually down the road, once we've gotten that to a certain point, we'll actually build a, a trading module on top of that. Long-term goals, of course, is to get out of beta with the second version. What we want to do with it when we release it is do a software as a service model. So we're not going to actually sell e-waves as a package. What we're going to do is, is sell subs it as a subscription service so people will get the signals from it. We might want to do some custom analysis because, again, one of the things we can do is you can define any basket you want, and it, it doesn't matter what it is. E-waves will count it for you. Um, so that's something that, that we can do. We can do some esoteric markets, in other words, that a lot of other people might not cover. And finally, a stretch goal for us, which, which probably won't be in version 2, but maybe in a 2.1 that we've been thinking about is doing real time. So in other words, using Elliott Wave's intraday um, and actually publishing intraday uh, analysis with it. So that's basically the talk. And uh, if you want to check us out, we're at ewaves.com. Um, there's a bunch of newsletters there. You can go and read about what we've been working on. And there's a top secret link here that only you guys know about, which is ewaves.com, like audio. So if you find my voice soothing at all, then you can come every week on a Friday and you can listen to me speak. Um, I just give like a, a brief couple minute update on what we've been working on and how the project's going. So definitely come check it out. Um, the newsletter is open access too, so no charge and we invite you to share it with whoever you want to.